Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. Well, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy here, and we're going to continue our series today called Not This Again where we're talking about relational patterns that we all have. Have you ever find yourself and you're going in, you've been in a relationship with somebody and you're like, oh, wait a second, I thought we had this beat. I thought we had gotten past this. I thought we already had this conversation. I thought he had beat this. And then you're right back at it and going, not this again. Anybody relate to that? You're all liars. I'm just kidding. (laughs) We all have it because you know what, people, we just fall into these patterns. And we, we just find ourselves doing things over again. And you're like, why am I doing that again? So apparently, uh, I have an issue. Y'all know I have lots of issues. But um, I, have a really, I have a real problem remembering holidays. And, you know, they happen every year. But I just have a real problem remembering them. Last week, I was walking through HEB. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. They have, like, this whole table set out with chocolate-covered strawberries. And there's, like, these cupcakes with hearts on them. I was like, huh, maybe they're just experimenting with hearts or something. I don't know. And then I walked past the flowers like, man, they've got a lot of flowers right now. They must be expect. I don't know why. Is it sp- I guess it's spring. There's flowers. Well, I bring my, my daughter in later that afternoon with me, and she's like, dad, look at all the stuff that's out for Valentine's Day. And I was like, oh, Valentine's Day. This again? I feel like we just did this, like 365 days. I got to think of this again. And, you know, Emily had already been dropping subtle hints like a couple weeks ago. She's like, you know, it'd be really nice if you'd plan something on Valentine's Day, even if it's just going out to lunch together. And I was like, yeah, 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 we'll get to that. Well, I started to realize, shoot, that's like day after tomorrow. I got to figure this out. I'm bad at remembering holidays. And listen, I'm not just bad at remembering the lame ones like Valentine's Day. I am bad at remembering the big ones. So every November, Emily comes to me and she's like, hey, Joel, I'm going to start setting money aside and we're going to set this budget for gifts that we're going to buy for family members. And she's like, what should the budget be? And I'm like, yeah, just whatever, 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 whatever. Well, around about December 23rd, we're like, hey, we're going to the family. And I'm like, oh, shoot, maybe we, should we get them some gifts or something? And she's like, Joel, I've already talked about this. And I'm like, well, how much did you spend? She's like, the amount we agreed on. I'm like, oh, man, do we? that was a lot. I agreed on that amount. I'm like, what? <laughs> I have a hard time remembering, and you know what? It always stresses my wife out that I forget about these holidays. So I asked her yesterday, I was talking to her, I was like preparing for this message, and I said, Emily, you know, I know the holiday thing, but like, what is it like living with me? <laughs> it's a bad question to ask, by the way. And she goes, well, you want, you want to be, I'll be honest. I was like, what? She's like, it's kind of stressful. So what do you mean it's stressful? And she's like, well, you're always freaking out about something, stuff that's not going to happen. You're always worrying about something. And I'm like, all right, I'll give you that one. She's like, what else? And she's like, well, you're always like learning new things, and you think I want to hear about it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, and she's like, it's just it kind of stresses me out because you come in all excited about this new thing you've learned. I'm like, oh, wow. So, so I, I, here's what I found out about myself, y'all. Apparently, I stress people out. (laughs) Now, here's what I know about you. You do too. Yeah, yeah. Some of y'all, you know you stress people out. Some of y'all, you know your driving stresses people out. You're like, why do you have to, do you have to ride right up on their bumper? Right, if. And uh, some of you, man, you just, you're just stressful people, and you know it, right? Some of us pride ourselves on how stressful we are as people. I say, yeah, it's good. People need to be stressed. It's, you know, I, bring, you know, I, I used to always pride myself. I always thought that when people came to me with their problems, they wanted me to show them the practical steps to take to get out of the problem. I'm like, well, that's, that's easy. You just need this, this, and bam, problem solved. And they, I started discovering people just started avoiding me. I'm like, what's the deal? I'm like, well, you, you kind of stress us out with all your answers to our problems. I'm like, What? That's my gift to you. <laughs> so we're going to start this morning, and I because here's the thing. I know you stress people out, so I want to start. Some of y'all are Catholics, and you haven't been to confessional in a long time. So I'm going to give you your moment for absolution here. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, forgive me, for I have stressed people out. Say it, say it. Did you do the... Did you do the 
Okay. And, and some of you, your, your spouse is like, thank God for revelation. Now, I know for a fact, some of you don't actually believe what you said. Because some of you are like, yo, I'm a chill person. How could I possibly stress my spouse out? You're like, man, when it, you know, they're driving like bats out of hell. And me, I just get in that right lane and I go 55. And we're like, yeah, and the speed limit's 70. Come on, man. You're slowing us down. You're stressing me out. Y'all relate to that, right? Amen. Every day. You stress people out. Some of y'all are like, oh, man. You know, some of you, you stress people out because you're negative all the time. And some of you, you stress people out because you're positive all the time. And you wake up in the morning all chipper. And you're like, hey. And everybody's like, just, you're stressing me out. Just, 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 I haven't had my coffee. I used to work with this guy, man. I had a 4.45 a.m. shift. And I'd come in, and he was already there. And he'd be like, hey, Joel, you ready for a good morning? I'd be like, shut up, Joe. Just shut <laughs> up. I just, Joe, I'm trying to wake up here, man. And he'd be like, yeah, it's a great morning to be alive. And I'm like, just, <laughs> you're stressing me out, Joe. Some of you, you're chipping. and some of you are like, well, I just can't imagine I would stress somebody out. Yeah, some of you, you guys are like, man, I'm just a chill presence in my home. And your wife's like, you need to be worried about this, sweetheart. You're stressing me out. And you're like, I'm not worried about it. I know, but remember last time we didn't worry about it and it happened? Every one of us in some way stresses people out. And do you know who you stress out the most? Typically, it's the people who love you the most. <laughs> and you're next to each other and you're like, man, it's like, I'm just trying to share my, oh, this was another one Emily have, used to happen with Emily and me. When we first got married, she'd be like, we should do this and this and that. And then and I'm thinking, money, 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 <laughs> money. And she's like, and I'm like, how much is that going to cost? And she's, and I'd be like, Emily, we can't do this because this, this, and this. And she's like, hey, just dream with me. And I'm like, <laughs> you're dreaming, stressing me out, woman. Like, yeah, you all relate to this, right? And we, we get in these relationships, we get in these patterns, and you're like, man, he always stresses me out, or he sh he's stressing me out because he should be worried about this, and his passivity is just concerning me. We all tend to stress each other out. So I want to talk this morning about self-awareness, because self-awareness is recognizing this fact. What you do has an impact on those around you. There's stuff happening inside of you that causes you to react in certain ways in the world that has an impact not just on you, it has an impact on your kids. They'll pick up your anxiety, they'll pick up your anger. It has an impact on your spouse. One of the great challenges in my life has always been anger. Now, I don't get angry at my wife or my, uh, my daughter, but I'll get angry at the stupid people around me. I'm like, oh, these people, and I'll come home and she'll be like, just, you're bringing bad vibes into the house. Calm calm down, Joel. And I'm like, look, you should be upset about this. And she's like, I'm already upset and you're the reason for it. <laughs> we have to realize that the way we are impacts others. Now, here's the thing. It is up to other people. Their response to you is their responsibility. However, a wise person knows that if you want to live in long-term relationship with people, you'd better pay attention to the effect you're having on other people. If you want to stay employed, you'd better pay attention to the effect you're having on other people. If you want to keep your employees, you'd better pay attention to the effect you're having on other people. And this is what Paul talks about in Romans. He says, Father, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. He's talking about humility here, and we're going to unpack humility in a second. But humility is just saying, have an accurate view of yourself. Humility isn't, oh, I'm nothing, I'm just a worm. No, no, you're actually a very valuable person. God died for your sins. You were so valuable, but you're also not that big of a deal. It's yes and. It's having this accurate view, saying, yeah, man, there's some really horrible things about me, but you know what? God put some things in me that I really needed to develop and give to the world. It's finding this accurate view of yourself. And then he says this, don't have a highly, more high view of yourself than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that is given. Now, sober, we think the opposite of sober would be, would be drunk, right? And some of us, honestly, we're a little drunk in our relationships. We're just kind of living for the moment. We're not thinking about the impact we're having on others because we're so self-focused. And that's the difference between self-awareness and self-focus, okay? 
Self-focus is realizing or is thinking you're the center of the world and it's all about you. Self-awareness is recognizing the things that I do, my behaviors have an impact on others. And I bring some good things to the table, but sometimes those good things can also be bad things and can harm those around me. And their response to me is their responsibility. But if I want to stay in a long-term relationship, the wise thing is I would better pay attention to those things about myself not for the sake of glamorizing them, but for recognizing they're impacting others. So the question you always be asked is this, how do I affect those around me? And sometimes that can be hard to see because we are blinded oftentimes by our own motives, by our own drives. And sometimes we're just a little too self-focused. So this is where Paul, he comes in back and he says this, listen guys, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, I think it's fascinating that Paul here, he doesn't say, let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. He says, don't just look to your own interests, because there are some things you need to pay attention to that are interests for you and your family, and you need to look at those things. But you also need to keep in mind that what you're doing impacts others around you. And this is the tricky balance because our motives can be really conflicted and confused. And sometimes we just thinking we're super spiritual, we don't actually... I I was talking to a pastor recently and he he really ticked me off. Um, (laughs) Pastors, I love them to death, but, you know, I just... Sometimes they can be really unself-aware. And they couch it in this spirituality. And listen, humans, we all humans have this tendency to do this. I said to him, I was like, yeah, your personality really impacts how you lead others. Because here's the bottom line. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which the Father prepared beforehand that you should walk in them, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. You have a unique, specific set of gifts and skills that you bring to the world. But the negative side of that can also be harmful. But a lot of times, we don't even pay attention to our own selves. And this is the answer he gave me. He's like, well, I don't worry too much about personality because I found I'm at my best when Jesus is at the center of everything I do. I'm like, get over yourself. (laughs) How often is Jesus really at the center of everything you do? Because if we're honest, Jeremiah says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can even know what it's thinking? My motives, man, they're conflicted. Sometimes I think I'm doing something with the most noble of motives. I am just, Jesus is driving me to do this. And then when I get it, I'm like, oh, this worked out really well for me. Was Jesus really driving me? And sometimes, you know, crazy thing is sometimes our motives are so conflicted, God will often use our screwed up motives and be like, yeah, I'm going to use those anyways to get you where you need to go. But man, it can be really hard. And that's what humility is recognizing. I've got some motives in me that I don't even know my own motives. And humility is recognizing I've got to pay attention to what my motives are doing to those around me. And you've got to be constantly on guard to where you're saying, I'm, I'm not only going to look out for my own interests, which we're, ten- we're always, honestly, we're always looking out for our own interests, except there's a few exceptions. And it says, but also the interests of others. So there's this guy named Carlo Cipolla, and he wrote this book, fascinating book, short little book called The Basic Laws of Human Stupidity. Now, don't shoot the messenger. That's actually what the book is titled, okay? And he's got these four laws. And he says, basically, humanity can be divided up into four kinds of people. There are people that he calls helpless people, and they benefit others at a cost to themselves. They lose. It's a loss to themselves, but a benefit to others. And there's what he calls intelligent people. They're the ones that benefit others, and then they bring a benefit to themselves while they're benefiting others. Then he says there are bandits. Those are politicians. Those are people that work, that benefit themselves (laughs) at a loss to others. Sorry, I'm just slip of the tongue there. But he says there's also... Another kind of people. He calls them stupid people. Again, don't shoot the messenger. I think the better word is what King Solomon calls foolish people. Foolish people do things at a loss to themselves and a loss to others. Now, his first law of stupidity is this. There are always more stupid people in the population than you can imagine. Because anyone with any decent amount of sanity would go, why would you do something that doesn't benefit yourself or others? Like, yeah, I get doing something that benefits yourself and then hurting others, but why are hurting us? Why would you do something that is both? And he says, we always miscalculate how many stupid people there are in the world. Fools. 
So he's like, you've got to take protective measures to watch out because there are going to be some people that are just going to do things that harm themselves and harm others. And you're like, what are you thinking? They're not. They're drunk. They're not sober. They don't have a sober mind. But a wise person goes, all right, I'm not only going to look after my own interests, but I'm going to make sure that everything I do and every decision, I'm going to go, how is this not only benefiting me because I am called to look after my own interests, take responsibility for my life, but in the process, how is this impacting those around me? How is my decision going to affect, uh, affect my kids? How is what's going on at work going to affect my home? Because it's all tied together. And you're constantly, with wisdom, you're asking, how does this affect those around me? That is what a wise, loving person does. And that is how we keep from being such a stressful person, realizing that there's stuff I'm going to do that I need to pay attention to. And this is what Paul picks it up. He finishes this. He says, he says, Jesus is always our example. He says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he was God in the flesh. He didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't use his, his godliness, his godlike nature for his own benefit. He says, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. He said, not only am I going I'm I'm to keep my God in the flesh, but I'm going to use it to serve others. Being, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And this is our example. He said, yeah, I'm God in the flesh. There's no doubt about that, but I'm going to make sure that I, I pay attention. I'm, I'm using what I've got to help others. And that is what wise living is. And that is how we make sure that we stay in long-term relationship with others, is constantly paying attention to not only to your own interests, but also to how that impacts others around you. And this is where Thomas Akempis, he wrote a book called The Imitation of Christ. It's actually the second most sold book in the world besides the Bible. You go, I've never even heard of that book. It's out there. It's been translated into hundreds of languages. The Imitation of Christ. And in it, he says, a humble knowledge of yourself is a surer way to God than a search after deep learning. And a lot of times we go, well, look, as a Christian, I'm called to deny myself. Yes, you are called to deny yourself, and you're called to take the gifts that God put in you and the abilities and talents and recognize what they, the, the, the blessings and the challenges of them and use them for his glory. That's stewardship. So it's not yes and no, it's yes and, which is one of the most, most of the big challenges in life aren't yes and no, they're yes and also. So the question is, how do I recognize what's in me that could be a positive, but I could also use it as a negative? Simple example of this. Maybe you're the planner who has a backup plan for your backup plan for the backup plan. That's me. I've always got a plan for the plan for the plan. But you know what the negative side of that is? You try and control and manipulate everything, and you're always paranoid and anxious and worried, and your anxiety is stressing out your family and your spouse is saying, you can't plan for everything, sweetheart. And you're like, well, I'm not going to move forward until I know I have a foolproof plan. And in, in, in the consequences, you actually limit where God wants to take you and your family because you won't move forward out of your own fear until you have all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. It's a gift you have, caring for your family, watching out for the details. But taken to the negative, it can impact and limit your family. Me, I talked about the anger that I have. I'm, I, I get very angry at injustice. And that can be a curse when I use it out of control. I bring home stress. I'm, I'm frustrated at things in the world that aren't right. That's not right that that's going on. But man, if you ever need somebody to, to back you up and kick a door in for you, you call me, okay? <laughs> if somebody's taking advantage of you, you call me. I will not be very pastoral for you. <laughs> that's a gift, right? But when I use it out of control, that very same thing that's a gift... The power that comes with this anger I've got, man, it can also be really damaging and harmful. So the, the goal is to say, okay, God, here's the reality of who you've made me to be. I've got these gifts and abilities. I want to use those for your glory. But I also want to make sure that I don't use the negative side of those to harm those around me. And that's where self-knowledge comes in. And that's the difference, again, between self-knowledge is knowing who you are and what you're about which leads to self-awareness, realizing how what you are impacts those around you, which ultimately leads to self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And self-control is realizing who you are, who you aren't, and making sure that everything that you've got is brought under the control of 
the lordship of Christ in your life. It's a very spiritual way to say it, the way I just said that. But it's literally like saying, God, I surrender this. I'm going to give this to you. And the best way to figure out, to get some increased self-awareness, is to find somebody around you and ask them this question. Hey, what's it like living with me? And that's a scary thing to ask, isn't it? Because especially if you give them permission to tell the truth, I'm not going to say anything. What's it like living with me? And here's what they're going to do. They're going to tell you, and they're going to go, well, that's not true. (laughs) Because remember, you think you're cool. I don't stress people out. That's a good thing about me. So the question you got to ask, what's it like living with me? Here, here, ask your... uh, the people that work for you. This is a scary thing to ask the people who work for you. Hey, what's it like working for me? You've been wondering why they've all been bailing. You can't keep good people. What's it like working for you? Oh. And then when, immediately when you say, no, that's not true, I want to encourage you to do this. The next step is to depend on the Holy Spirit. Where did my clicker go? There's a verse. I love this verse. King David says it. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Like, what's my actual motive, God? I'm saying I'm doing this for the family, but really maybe I'm just doing it because I just want to make sure that we're not, I don't want to be poor. Really what I'm doing is I'm working all these hours because I'm just terrified of being poor and it's taken away from the family. What's my actual heart in this, Lord? Test me and know my anxious thoughts. What's that thing that just keeps rolling around in your head that's causing all the anxiety? Lord, show me, what is it? What is that? My wife says I'm anxious and worried all the time. I just think I'm planning. She says I'm anxious and worried. Is that true, Lord? What is this? See if there's any offensive way in me. Lord, is there something I'm doing that I actually think is really great, but it's actually driving people away from me and it's destroying relationship and community? And we have to ask this question on a regular basis because people will tell you and they'll even hint it to you. But you'll go, no, surely that's not the case. And then he says, and lead me in the way everlasting. The best thing you can do when a reality comes about something you don't want to hear about yourself, and this is the challenge of it. With self-awareness, most of the time we're too close to ourselves to realize the problem. We just see the results of it, and we're like, what's going on here? In those quiet moments we ask that, but we don't think about it too long. We just keep moving along. When a moment of revelation comes, we say, what's it like living with me? And somebody says, well, it's kind of stressful. Because you're not, you're passively letting things slide that you should be confronting. And I'm actually having to pick up the slack. You're letting our kid behave in a way that I'm having to be the only one that disciplines them. Because you don't want to be the bad parent. You're not dealing with the financial issues that we know we have. You go, oh. And maybe you don't agree with them. Maybe you think you're just being super frugal. And they're, no, actually, you're just really a tightwad. Whatever it is, you go, Lord, search me, know me, check my heart. Is what they're saying true? If it is, I want to change. I want to be all that you say that I can be. I want to make sure that I'm not only lifting myself up, but I want to lift up others around me in the way that I'm living. And here's the cool part about it. He's the one who will give you the power to change. When you ask for his help and you say, Lord, I can't do this on my own because my natural bent is to do this. He'll give you the power you need to change and become all that he says you can be. And that's my prayer for y'all. I want to see you guys have relationships that are thriving, where you're not constantly going, this again? Where you're going, oh, this, is, this popped up again, so it's time to deal with this this time. We're going to break the cycle of this pattern that happens over and over again. And you start to pay a little bit more attention to what's going on inside of you when you feel that anger, when you feel that fear, when you feel that anxiety, that frustration. Say, God, search my heart. Like, what's causing this? And and how is this impacting those around me? Because I want to be in a relationship that's life-giving with those around me. I want to be a source of life for them. And as I'm a source of life for them, I believe you're going to send people that are going to be a source of life for me. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And that's my prayer for all of you. That we would have life-giving relationships where you're going, Man, we are constantly getting better. Because, yeah, we bump up against each other sometimes. And... But man, I just believe that God's rubbing off that part of me that doesn't need to be there anyways to that person that's next to me that I stress out. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you are, man, you have a plan for us. We are are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which you prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I pray that 
this morning we would awaken to the good things about us that you put in us that maybe we've been pushing down and thinking, well, to, to acknowledge I'm good at that would be, wouldn't be humility. I help us, help us realize that is humility, to recognize the gifts you put in us. But then the humility to realize that gift isn't for us, it's for others. And I thank you, Lord, for those that have just been feeling beat down. And maybe their beat downness has actually been bringing others around them. Lord, I pray that you would lift them up this morning and help them see the true reality of who you say they are. If you're here this morning and you do not have your relationship right with Jesus, that is the most important relationship. You got to get that one right before any of your other relationships are going to be okay. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it in your heart, God is going to come. He's going to forgive your sins. He's going to put your past behind you. He's going to set you up with an eternal address with him in eternity. It starts when we say this prayer. Let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.